Hi, I'm Travis Hartman with the ODNR Division of Wildlife. I'm the Lake Erie Program Administrator, and this is our Sandusky Research Station here on Sandusky Bay on Lake Erie. We actually have two offices. We have one at Fairport Harbor, which is east of Cleveland, and we have the Sandusky office here. And out of this office, we primarily work on the western basin. We work out on the open waters of the western basin pretty much from Toledo to about Vermilion and then we this time of year we also work in the rivers so the Maumee River the Sandusky River and you know this is primarily our, our western basin research station and then down in Fairport east of Cleveland they uh, they work on the central basin waters of Ohio's Lake Erie and they pretty much work from Vermilion all the way to Conneaut so they have a vessel and do their own trawling and, and sampling over there and then over here we have our set of vessels where we work in the western station has four fisheries biologists, a supervisor, and, also, and multiple technicians that, that help accomplish a lot of the, the work throughout the season. I grew up in northwest Ohio on a, on a farm. I did a lot of fishing, farm ponds and creeks when I was young, and I decided to go into fisheries management at Ohio State. So I got a bachelor's degree in fisheries management, and then I stayed on and got my master's. And I was very fortunate to uh, work for Ohio State and do some research up here on the wetlands around Sandusky Bay. And after having fished up here as a kid, I, I knew for sure I wanted to, to live and work up here after becoming familiar with Erie and, and really falling in love with it. So we have a hand, handful of vessels here that we use for Lake Erie work. Our biggest boat is a 53 feet research vessel, which isn't in the water quite yet, but that's primarily our trawl vessel. These two vessels are an Ohio State vessel and then our Division of Wildlife vessel, and we do most of our work off of these 30 feet aluminum boats. We do water sample collections, gill netting, and uh, a little bit of everything that we do here goes on in these smaller vessels that are a little faster and, and more convenient to, to move around by trailer or by water. We're very fortunate here on Lake Erie. We have one of the most productive, great, the most productive Great Lake, and of course here walleye and yellow perch are extremely popular, and that, that's quite frankly what brought me to Lake Erie. Is that this is the most unique walleye fishery in the world. As a division of wildlife, our primary objective is to assess what's out there. You know, this is a little different than an inland situation. We're not stocking fish like they would in a reservoir or a smaller lake. We're really dictated by the natural conditions, environmental conditions, and those determine what we get as far as hatches for both perch and walleye. And then it's our job to assess what's out there and then appropriately manage the, the adult population. With walleye, we're very fortunate because they live over 20 years. Our newest aging techniques have found walleye up to 26 years old. And walleye from 10 to 20 are very common. Right now we have a huge year class from 2003 that's still one of our, our primary, primarily harvested age classes. So this year in 2017 we'll have a lot of 14 year old fish harvested. Those are the big fish, the, the trophies that everyone comes to Lake Erie for. We're also very fortunate to have two young year classes that are very large. This year we're going to have two year old and three year old walleye that are the most abundant fish in the system. So you'll catch a lot of fish right around our 15 inch minimum size limit early in the year. You'll probably have to throw a lot back. But these are the two big year classes that are going to fuel this fishery and keep it great for the, the really the next five to six years easily and then beyond that as they get bigger. We're very fortunate here on Erie to have partners around the lake that we work with. In a small lake inland, obviously each state would would manage each lake as they choose, but here on Erie we don't just have multiple states, we have two countries with Canada. So we come together through the Great Lake Fish Commission, uh, specifically with the Lake Erie Committee, and throughout the year we all do our own surveys. So here in Ohio we know our fisheries, we know our waters, and we survey our anglers, we survey our commercial fishermen, and then we do population surveys outside of harvest. At the end of the year all these data sets come together with the other Lake Erie agencies, the other jurisdictions, and we do a yellow perch population estimate and a walleye population estimate, and those estimates are used in a quota setting process where each of the five jurisdictions around Lake Erie sit down. I'm the Lake Erie committee representative for our jurisdiction and we come to consensus on what what this year's safe level of harvest is. So last week up in Ypsilanti, Michigan, we determined the walleye quota and the yellow perch quotas by basin and those will be the safe harvest limits for this season and then each jurisdiction gets their portion and determine their limits. So we're all responsible for adhering to that safe level of harvest by managing our own fisheries. On Lake Erie it's a very unique situation where it is a consensus quota system. So the five representatives, one from each jurisdiction, sit down in a 
room and and the population models are important we have the walleye population model the perch population models by base and, and that that does guide our decision relative to quota but we take everything into account the biological situations social situations economics you know we look at what do the models say and how does that fit with what we know and then at the end of the day there's a, a quota range that's set by the harvest policy. We look at that quota range and say, where are we comfortable setting that quota? And, and we go around the room and all five of us have to agree. It's not a majority, it is a consensus. And once we're all comfortable with what each quota is, then we set them for the year. And that's when we all move forward with our own policies to stay within quotas. So obviously perch and walleye are the kind of the value species or the quota species, but there's a lot more going on than that. You know, we do work together uh, with our other partners to look at the forage population, so how many bait fish are out there and how does that interact with, with the quota species. But individually we all manage our own smallmouth bass and white bass and all those other species that aren't specifically quota management species. You know, we do surveys every year that, that we see white bass population numbers or uh, um, abundance numbers. We also have a big creel survey, an angler survey, where we specifically estimate how much of every species is both caught, released, and then harvested too. So we have a data set back to 1980 that's uh, angler harvest in Ohio waters of Lake Erie for all species. So there's really a lot going on on Lake Erie. There's a lot within each jurisdiction, but then it also comes together across the lake through the Lake Erie Committee to set annual limits. Obviously, Lake Erie, Lake Erie's gone through a lot of change uh, with human settlement and draining of the, the Black Swamp and all the wetlands in the Western Basin. You know, back it's interesting that back in the late 1800s, the number one commercially harvested species were pike and muskie, the sausages. And while they're still obviously present, uh, you know, we do still see some muskie, and, and at least early in the spring here in this area, we see some pike. But that was the most abundant harvested species back in the late 1800s, and after the wetlands were drained and habitat changed, you know, we saw a decline in those populations and sturgeon were another very uh, common fish at, in those times. They're a very long-lived fish. They live up to 100 years or more and get very large, four or five feet long. They went through a period where they were nearly extinct between pollution and overharvest and, and environmental issues. But we're kind of in a neat period now because we're seeing some of those historical species come back. There's been a lot of work done with sturgeon in the Detroit River. We're seeing from tagged sturgeon in the Detroit River that they moved down into Erie. Our commercial trap net fishery occasionally catches and releases sturgeon, so we have reports from that fishery. And right here off of uh, Sandusky Bay is an area that we see a fair number of lake sturgeon that are caught and released. So in, in some, some ways, you know, as dynamic as Lake Erie is, now that we've seen improvements for the Clean Water Act and, and fewer pollution sources to the lake, we're seeing some of these historical spe species make a recovery. Uh, one of the other interesting uh, species, uh, set of species are lake trout and whitefish. Uh, obviously the lake's a little warmer than it, it was for quite a while and cold water species like lake trout and whitefish are, are suffering a little bit just from the warmer water temperatures. There's a lot of research right now going on on why lake trout aren't able to reproduce like they used to be and also why the whitefish reproduction is a, a lot more sporadic. So as far as we've come, you know, we still have new issues and uh, we're still trying to recover some of those historical species that are at a lower population level than they used to be. But that's what makes Lake Erie so fun, the constant change. And, and with new research techniques, we learn new things about species every year and try to put it into practical management use and, and help those uh, species of fish recover. So if you've looked at the paper or internet lately, you've probably read about Asian carp. Uh, I think there is a lot of confusion about the individual species that are generally lumped in as Asian carp. So if you see the videos of, of leaping silver carp, that's kind of the, the big concern. The Mississippi River is full of silver carp and also bighead carp. And the big concern ecologically is that they're plankton eaters. So these are large fish that filter feed a lot of plankton every day. And obviously Lake Erie would, would potentially be very conducive to supporting them. So, you know, we're, we're trying to work with our state and federal partners to, to make sure that silver and bighead carp stay in the Mississippi system and don't make it to the Great Lakes and specifically Erie because it potentially impact our food chain and it impact the base of the food chain, which, which is a, an extreme concern. One of the other species you might hear 
uh, talked about when Asian carp are mentioned are grass carp. And grass, grass carp are very different. Grass carp are stocked in the ponds, people use them for vegetation control, and they have gotten into the Lake Erie system. So when you hear about Asian carp in Lake Erie, most likely it's, it's grass carp. And it's a little bit of history. They've been here since the early 80s. We have positive captures and identifications of grass carp since you know three decades ago at least. And it, it is a concern. You know, Certainly it's a non-native species. It's a vegetation eater. So it has the potential to impact habitat. And on Lake Erie, vegetation tends to be annually very different. Uh, water clarity conditions, environmental conditions can actually dictate how much vegetation there is out there. But now we have this species that's been in the system that potentially eats and modifies the vegetation. So when you're reading stories about Asian carp, make sure you read through the details to, to find out if we're talking about silver carp, big head carp, or grass carp. Grass carp are here. We do see them with some regularity. The silver and big head carp that are in the Mississippi River are not here. We've not ever sampled a silver carp in Lake Erie. So very different threats and different issues. Um, make sure you do some research when you're reading about Asian carp because there, there are confusion. There is confusion about which species is which. This is actually a, a current profiler, an ADCP instrument that this will sit on the bottom of the lake near the reefs and it has onboard logging and a, a battery pack. And this sits in the bottom and shoots beams up into the water column and you can actually profile the, the current flow above the instrument. So we'll leave it out in the lake during the spawning season for about two months and then when it's done we'll retrieve it and download all the data and it gives us one meter by one meter cells of what direction water was flowing and the velocity it was flowing. And you know, sometimes when we don't have much wind, there isn't much water flow at all, and then you get a large wind event, it's actually currents that, that are similar to those in a river. So in some ways, Lake Erie is really a, a big riverine system almost with all the water coming in from the Detroit River and flowing to the east to exit Erie and go over the falls. And there's a lot of dynamics that go on with water flow and current and how that impacts spawning. So we have instruments like this to document it each spring and look at the year class strength relative to what water currents did around the reefs that spring. So obviously going forward here on Lake Erie, you know, we, we need to use our research, use our assessment and kind of predict forward where what that means for the lake. So does climate change potentially impact the stocks of fish and how do uh, people use the lake and, and it, through the Creel survey and through some other things we've done, we can kind of look at use patterns and what people fish for and, and how effort levels compare. You know, a lot of what we do is kind of being reactive. And uh, we react to things going on right now, but then we also try to be proactive and look at, at future climate predictions and, and user trends and and really manage for the future of Lake Erie. And, you know, that, I've mentioned previously, Lake Erie is very dynamic and uh, we try to do the best we can at using all the information available to manage appropriately and be sustainable, quite frankly, and manage for the conservation of all the stocks and best use going into the future.